All right, this week's topic is titled The Fight Against Inequality. And when we talk about inequality at this point, we're talking not only about slavery, but also uh, we're going to dive into uh, the issue of women's rights. Um, we all know that slavery was a terrible institution um, in the South. <clears throat> um, slaves faced terrible hardship working very long days, um, treated terribly. Um, and although some people say that slaves were oftentimes treated as part of the family, that was a really rare case. And most slaves experienced a very terrible uh, existence. Oftentimes, if they ever stepped out or um, if they ever got in trouble, uh, the beatings they would get would be enough to deter them from ever doing that again. Um, but there was one slave that we're going to talk about. His name is Nat Turner, and his story is one of um, fighting for, for his own freedom and for that of his fellow slaves. Um, Nat Turner was a religious man and had a vision um, from God and used that vision to inspire himself and 40 other slaves to rise up against their slave owners. Uh, it resulted in killing of f over 50 slave owners, going from basically house to house, uh, killing those on the path and freeing the slaves along the way. Um, eventually, Nat Turner and his men are caught, um, and over 200 slaves in total were accused of being part of this, although not all of them were you know, thrown in jail. But uh, Nat Turner did face uh, execution, uh, was killed for his actions, but um, it showed the rest of the country and, and, and the South especially that slaves were organizing. Slaves were starting to, to rise up against their masters, and this was the largest slave revolt of its time. So the fear, uh, at least in the white slave owners' eyes, was that if um, if they don't you know beat their slaves more, if they don't try to repress them more and keep them contained more, that they're going to deal with the same uprising that Turner um, uh, made the people in Virginia experience. <clears throat> Now, part of slavery is obviously the transport of those slaves from Africa to um, to the South. And we know the international slave trade ended in 1808, so that meant that no longer could slaves be taken from um, their homes in Africa and brought over. But, but that was actually still going on. And it was going on in a way where they were taking them from Africa, but taking them to the Caribbean. And in this case, um, a group of slaves were taken, over 300 of them from Africa, and 53 of them were sold to a Cuban um, slave owner, and he changed their documents to say basically that they were Cuban themselves when in fact they were from Africa. By doing this, it made uh, slavery legal, um, and it made their shipping from one place to another legal. And so these 53 uh, uh, Africans were put on a boat and shipped, um, but what the slave owner didn't have in store, or didn't know what he had in store for, was um, the basically uprising of these slaves against them. And so these 53 slaves um, end up killing the captain and, and a cook um, with machetes and um, with their chains, and then they force the rest of the crew to, to basically take them back to Africa. But that isn't what happens. Instead, the ship, they kind of lose their, their bearings, and it actually ends up landing in New York. And when it gets to New York, the, the ship called the Amistad, um, this ship would become very famous because it would be the name of the, the Supreme Court case, um, the U.S. versus the Amistad. And this group of slaves that were, were, were shipped to, basically taken to America, um, were being argued about. What are we going to do with these slaves? You have the southern slave owners in southern states saying, send them back to uh, the Caribbean. They are still property of somebody. And then the white abolitionists in the north saying, well, no, we should ship them back to Africa because they were taken illegally because the slave trade was illegal. And in fact, the North or the, the, um, the group of the Amistad um, crew, the slaves there were represented by John Quincy Adams, um, former president. So they brought in um, Mr. Adams to, to, to basically argue on their behalf, and he was successful. And the Supreme Court ends up freeing these slaves instead of sending them back to the Caribbean. He ends up freeing them and sending them back to Africa. So if, if we learn a couple things here, when the slaves were rising up against their masters and against the institution of slavery. They were successful in, in some ways and unsuccessful in others, um, but the, uh, the group uh, that was part of the Amistad was successful in, in getting their freedom. Now, we're going to move to the abolition movement and talk about what that was about. And we know abolition is uh, the idea of getting of abolishing something, and in this case, that would be slavery. And it was a huge movement um, during the, the, the middle 1800s, and eventually it's successful in slavery, uh, is, is abolished after the 13th Amendment. Um, but the group of people leading this abolition movement are, are quite often white. Um, many of them are women. Um, a lot of them are men and most of them live in the north. And in fact, most of them are living in, in the New England area and believe in this idea called transcend 
transcendentalism. And this is a philosophy of the time that says basically that individuals can determine for themselves what's right and wrong and that they don't need society to do that for them. And one of the main arguments well, at the time was, well, if we listen to society, society tells us that slavery is okay, that women not voting is okay, that treating people unequally is okay. And what these people that follow this philosophy said, well, that, that isn't okay, that's wrong. And we are powerful enough to change that. And one person that would kind of fall into this category is William Lloyd Garrison. He begins the, this newspaper called The Liberator. And William Lloyd Garrison is a, a radical abolitionist, someone who uh, vehemently believes in what, um, that slaves should be free, that immigrants should be treated better, that women should have the right to vote. Um, and he runs this newspaper from 1831 to 1865 when the 13th Amendment is passed, which frees all slaves. And he played a huge role in basically convincing a larger public, a larger group of people that um, slavery was wrong. And it was a hard road, and he wasn't popular many times, but his radical behavior is what got um, uh, his mission accomplished, that got the 13th Amendment and slaves were eventually freed. Now, another group of writers gathered in a magazine called The Atlantic. In fact, it's still in publication today. Um, these writers were um, prominent during the time. Many of them were poets, um, essayists, novelists. They, they wrote great works, and then they would also combine their work in The Atlantic. And this magazine was, again, meant to kind of um, highlight this transcendentalist philosophy that uh, people can determine their own success and their own fate. They don't need society to tell them what's right and wrong. So famous, th famous authors like Ralph Waldo Emerson in the upper left, Henry David Thoreau on the right, um, the bottom right is Nathaniel Hawthorne, um, and then Harriet Beecher Stowe we'll talk about a little bit. These are famous poets, writers of the time and were heavy hitters in convincing America that slavery was wrong, that women should be able to vote. Um, this Atlantic magazine gave them the platform to do that. Another person that we've already talked about is Frederick Douglass. And again, uh, his experience is, is very unique. Was a captain, was a slave for, for 20 years of his life, but eventually was able to escape when he was, when he was 20. Um, he, while in slavery, taught himself to read and write, which made him um, extremely intelligent, um, which was something that the slave owners were afraid of. That's why they never taught them, their slaves to read and write. Uh, but he did it on his own. And um, he, when he got out of captivity, uh, he wrote a book about his life um, called The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave. And it being published in the 1840s um, was basically just another part of the abolition movement. And many abolitionists read this and, and, and it read about the terrible conditions Frederick Douglass lived under. And they wanted to, it only impassioned them and made them want to work towards ending slavery in America. So Frederick Douglass is an important figure there as a writer, but also as a, a political figure as well. Um, he was able to convince a lot of politicians to, to push for ending slavery. Another writer that we'll talk about is Harriet Beecher Stowe. She's the writer of a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin. And Uncle Tom's Cabin was um, a, a unique book. It, it came out in magazines and pieces and then, um, it then eventually was published as a complete book. But each week as people would read this magazine, they would read about the slave owner Simon Legree there on the left um, and the harsh punishment and cruel treatment um, that he used with Uncle Tom. And, and throughout the whole story, Uncle Tom is, is, is a graceful, humble person who um, basically stands up to, to Legree as... Um, as, as someone who with dignity and doesn't let his beatings uh, beat him down spiritually and it's a very religious type of book um, it, it evokes God a lot but this um, this book um, inspired again a lot of abolitionists because they saw the cruel treatment even though it's fiction they saw the cool tr cruel treatment Uncle Tom was under and they knew that they had to fight up and, and rise up against that um, in the South, though, um, Harry Beecher Stowe was criticized. So this was a, div a divisive book, and people in the North thought it was great, and it was very popular there. And the people in the South often uh, criticized it. And then our final thing today is going to be talking about women's rights. And it's a, a small part, or not a small part, I'm sorry, of history, but in our presentation, unfortunately, is just for the sake of time. Um, but two women that we're going to need to know about are Lucretia Mott and then Elizabeth Stanton, both women women. 
um, were, were, were either Quaker or Christian or very religious. Um, they, their goal was basically to increase the amount of rights that women had in America. And they organized a group of women at Seneca Falls in New York. Um, over 300 people, including 40 men, gathered in Seneca Falls to, to discuss the issue of women's rights. And what many women found and what many abolitionists found is that their cause was very similar. It was about increasing equality for everybody. Not just, not just slaves, not just women, not just immigrants, but everybody. And so what came out of this was the Declaration of Sentiments. And one of the declarations was that women should be able to vote, that women should be able to own land, that women should be treated more equally. And although this didn't you know, accomplish anything at the time in terms of law, it did inspire people to, to work towards creating laws that would allow women to be treated more equally. So with all that this week, um, I know that's a lot. But we're going to uh, be covering quite a bit because the movement to end slavery to increase women's rights was vitally important to understanding really what the Civil War was about, what the country was going through at the time, and then how the country would eventually change in the future. So let me know if you have any